AJ, what's going on, my man? Hey, brother. How you doing? Doing very well. Uh, for everyone who's either new or um, just as a reminder for anyone who's done this before, um, I'm Morgan Carey. I'm the CEO here at Real Estate Webmasters. Um, we have our, our coach, AJ Hazzy, here. He's going to be doing a presentation today on uh, exactly how, how he runs. I mean, he's actually, I'm going to take a step back. Exciting news. AJ has actually signed on for the whole year to do one of these every single month. And so that's super exciting. I'm going to make sure I drop that link for the next um, the next um, session in the chat a few times. So make sure you sign up for it. Um, but yeah, it's I mean, this this content, this is my favorite content because it's all about leverage. It's all about how to up your game and um, how, how to increase your, your revenues and get more of your time back at the same time. So that's super exciting for me. But I wanted to start off this session a little bit different because we're now um, a full year uh, since AJ, this, this academy idea wasn't actually my idea. This was AJ's idea. AJ said, hey, listen, I really love what I do. I want to teach it. Um, and, uh, you know, I know you've got this audience of people who really want to grow their businesses. And would you be open to me presenting to them what I do? And I said, yeah, sure. So a year ago, I was just blown away by the content, right? AJ was a an amazing customer of ours. He was crushing it with the Renaissance and our lead gen and all that sort of stuff, doing you know, millions and millions in GCI. But, you know, obviously his coaching program was, was new to him and new to us. And over the past year, he and I have worked together a lot, not just on this academy, but we've actually worked together on several projects, which has been a lot of fun. AJ has referred several customers to us that he was coaching and we referred customers to him. And I got to tell you, I, a year later, I am so glad that we made this, this commitment and partnership. I mean, just in this last week, I, I got on a call with a customer I hadn't even known, like I haven't even spoken to, you know, on our fast track program. And uh, AJ came up and he was like, man, I invited AJ out to my entire brokerage. This guy has like, a, you know, a franchise in Oregon and a franchise in Washington. And he's like, that dude is the real deal, right? So it's not just... These sessions will blow you away. We think they will, and it's amazing content, but I highly recommend that you reach out to AJ. If you're in that position where you're a team and you just really want to get to the next level or a brokerage, I can give AJ a true testimonial now for his coaching because my customers have used him. And on the flip side, I mean, I was actually just doing a review of some of the referrals that AJ sent us. Average cost per lead for the fast track is 10 bucks right now starting the year, which is pretty awesome. And our best... AJ referral is at $5.74 a lead, $5.74. So that's pretty exciting to know that, you know, uh, our team is doing a great job doing lead gen for AJ as well. Um, but there's one last thing I want to talk about, and that is, um, you know, just again, pa this past week, um, big brokerage that we're working with together, thousands and thousands of leads. And, you know, we're both working really hard to help this, this brokerage really sort of build their e-team. And, uh, you know, we were, I think we were both noticing some of the agents, agents were having challenges, um, you know, keeping up with their calls, keeping up with their systems. And so I messaged AJ and, you know, middle of the night, almost like way after business hours, he jumps on the call with me and he's like, man, let me help you walk through this. We, we work together on the CRM. We like, and they, these guys use a third party CRM, by the way, that I'm not even familiar with. AJ jumps on, you know, and out of that call, we have a whole new game plan to help that brokerage identify those agents that may or may not be right for their e team and a way to help them identify that, work them through it. And, you know, it's, it's that kind of stuff that you can expect from AJ when you partner with him. So AJ, I just wanted to make sure I gave you a shout out and a testimonial here because this past year, it's been a pleasure to work with you on some of this stuff. And um, I've learned a lot more about the real estate business because of it. So I appreciate you. That's my spiel. The one last thing, guys, we're giving away a Tesla this quarter. So uh, you don't have to buy anything, just attending is, is more than enough. So uh, Eliana's captured everybody's attendance here and we're gonna enter you into a draw for a Tesla. But I will let you know if you do decide after you watch this um, this presentation that you want to learn more about what AJ does or what um, REW does for lead gen and fast track, you get extra draws in the Tesla giveaway for uh, for this quarter. So without further ado, uh, AJ, tell us what you're talking about today. Thanks for that intro. It was a very kind of you. I, uh, I want to talk today about something that's very near and dear to my heart, which is how to produce 
huge volume without working huge hours, right? So the name of the game is produce more while working less. How many folks on the call would like to learn how to do that? How many folks, give me a, give me a thumbs up in the chat if you're interested in increasing your dollar per hour earning capacity. Let's just see if that chat is working. Guys, we're gonna, get, we're gonna get interactive today. I want, I want <laughs> questions in real time. You guys can feel free to interrupt me in the chat. I wanna answer your questions, make sure that um, that you guys are getting the clarity you need. Sounds to me like we got some thumbs up on the concept of earning more for working less. We're good. Awesome. And just a reminder for everyone, if you could, um, go ahead and select everyone when you do a response to the chat as opposed to just panelists. That way other people can see your question. Really? Okay. So I, uh, as Morgan mentioned, I'm EJ Hazzy. I run a real estate team brokerage hybrid here in Kelowna, British Columbia. And uh, we've been doing this thing now since 2008 and have grown, uh, grown our company from a, a half a million dollar company now to, you know, to $10 million. And we're going to keep, keep rolling. I really still feel like we're just getting started. And, you know, we mentioned our numbers there a moment ago. You know, it's all possible based on the concept of leverage. And that is something, if, if there's one thing that I know how to do well, it's to get people who are smarter than me into the roles specifically to work uh, and do a better job than I would in those specific roles. And so now with Advantage Academy, my, uh, my obsession is just teaching you guys this stuff. And uh, if people want help with the implementation of it, of course, I'm here to do that, but in a very limited capacity because I'm one of the few coaches that's operating at this level that is still doing this on a one-to-one -one basis. Most people hire other coaches to work under them. I haven't done that. I will eventually within you know 18 months or so, I'll have a team of coaches. But right now I'm doing it one-to-one, -one, which means my capacity is a little bit limited. So I can only take a handful of folks uh, along for that ride. So if you're interested, uh, by all means, just reach out. The model we've created has been called the, the future of real estate or the real estate office of the future. And, and this highly, highly leveraged model solves the major problems that most agents face, which is number one, where is my next piece of business going to come from? And number two, once I get busy, how do I have some semblance of a life? I think depending on where you guys are at in your careers, you may be experiencing this already where your success cannibalizes your personal life. It cannibalizes the things that bring you joy. You know, you know, I went through this. I wasn't playing golf anymore. I wasn't going snowboarding. I never saw my friends. I was barely ever going on date nights with my girl. I was just all consumed by the business. Now that was some time ago and I've solved that problem a long, a long, long while ago. But I can remember vividly feeling like my success had cannibalized my life. Who has felt that or is currently feeling that way right now? Throw it in the chat. Morgan, yeah, very on up on there. Aaron's feeling that way. Good, Bettina, for sure. Now, I'd be curious just as a show of hands here as well, just throw in there a number, just roughly, how many hours a week you guys feel like you're working right now? Or last year, if you like, take last year, a very successful year, how many, how many hours a week would you say you're putting in? 60, 85, 70 to 80. 100, holy moly, unlimited, no limit. Well, there is a limit, 24 in a day. Anybody else? These are a lot of hours, guys. You, the, so it sounds like I'm preaching to the choir. 55 to 65, Mark's got 70 cooking, 75, big, big time hours. So this is the problem with our industry, and this was the problem that I sought to solve with our, our business model. And... It's a results-based business for sure. So I, you know, I can share with you our results and how we stack up in our marketplace. Our average agents on our team sell at 51 homes. We're selling homes faster for more money. So all the stats that would matter to a home seller, we are absolutely dominating our marketplace. But the 51 per agent is the one I want to focus on because most people would assume that if our agents are doing that much volume, that they probably are working around the clock cranking the same hours that you guys are, the 75, 80 hours a week. And you're welcome to survey any of my agents on the front lines. You will find that they are absolutely not. The, most of them, when they're honest, particularly the ones as they get higher and higher in production, 
are working less and less because as revenue permits, we hire more and more people to do, to do the heavy lifting. And so the secret sauce to all of this is leverage. And if you've heard me on other webinars, you know, I beat this drum consistently. If I have one overarching thing that I teach, it's that you've got to get leverage in your business. And realtors are notorious for feeling like they have to do everything themselves. And this is a, a slide I've used in other presentations, but it bears repeating. Most agents feel like they have to choose between providing great service and increasing their volume because they feel like it's a zero sum game. If they get too busy, they can't provide the service. It's when you understand leverage and you make that mental shift that you no longer have to choose between the two that the whole world opens up to you. And so that's what I want to focus on today is I want to talk about making the shift and getting the right butts in the right seats so that you can have your life back and still continue to scale your volume. So the problem with our industry is, A, there's no agreed upon business model that we all subscribe to. You know, it's not like the dental industry or the legal industry where, you know, you've got hygienists and you've got dental um, uh, assistants and you've got a whole curriculum to train those folks to come in and leverage you. It's not that. It's, it's very much everybody's out there trying to figure out the formula for themselves, scratching their head. And it leaves a lot of people confused and in a space where they feel like, well, if it's meant to be, it's up to me. I guess I've just got to do all of this work. And the vast majority of agents stay in that space for their whole career. And it's really sad because there is a promised land on the other side of it. And once you recognize that removing yourself as the bottleneck is the answer, the whole world opens up to you. Now, most people on this call have heard of Pareto's law, which is the 80-20 principle. And that is that the few vital tasks, the 20%, will produce 80% of your results. But the 80% of the time that you expend in your business and in your day, the many trivial tasks, will only result in 20% of your overall uh, results. So we got to get on the right side of this equation. And this is really the key to getting leverage is to understand, okay, what of what I do in a day? You need to audit your, your workload and figure out where the 20% of the items are, the few vital tasks that are moving the needle the most for you. You need to figure out what those are and you need to make that your job description and you need to make the other 80% someone else's job description. So this is just an example of what a workload might look like. And you have to figure out what it is that makes the cut. So you've got things like developing marketing initiatives and you know, looking at tracking and prospecting and follow-up and asking for reviews and the list goes on and on and on. This is a list of say 50 tasks that might be on it. And our list is much larger than this, but this is just a, a visual example of this. So you might audit everything that it is that you're doing and go, okay, of these items, what are the 20% or the 10 items that are moving the needle the most for me in my business? So slicing and dicing, you might cut it down in round one to what I believe are sort of the 10 or the 20% of things that, that provide you with the biggest result. So developing marketing initiatives is one of the last things that you let go of because nobody understands the context of your business better than you. And this is really a highly leveraged activity because you can put one program together that is going to bring in you know, hundreds, if not millions of dollars. Uh, so that is a very leverage activity and something you'll want to hold on to. Reviewing tracking, nobody's going to care about the indicators and the KPIs more than the, than the boss. So reviewing the tracking is something that you don't delegate until you're well down the track. Prospecting, you know, picking up the 10,000 pound phone and uh, making it rain. That is one of the last things to delegate as well. Carrie wants to see the previous slide as well. Sure, I can go back. I can send you guys the deck on this too if you want. Yeah, just a reminder for, for anyone who's who's signed up with REW for REW Academy Premium, all of these are available for replay. So um, you can always get access to go back and pause and screenshot and all that sort of stuff, as well as um, any downloads we make available via REW Academy as well. So if you're signed up for Academy, don't worry if you miss a slide, you can always go back and watch these as many times as you like. Nice. So 
We know prospecting is definitely how we make the cash register ring. And then you've got thought leadership content. This is where you're establishing yourself as the authority in the marketplace, highly, highly leveraged. Um, doing buyer consults, again, one of the last things you get rid of, but you'll still do that in the early stages. You'll notice showings and things like that are not on the slide anymore, right? But buyer consults, helping people chart their course, and helping people, just like a dentist would sit down and review the x-rays with the patient before turning it over to the dental hygienist or to the dental assistant, exactly the same. You're going to be there, help them chart the course, and then you jump in, solve problems as needed. After that, building the team becomes one of the most important activities that you would keep. You probably want to keep all your listing presentations for the first little while, keep those near and dear. And then anything business development wise that might involve going to masterminds, taking trainings. And it might also just be uh, as simple as prospecting or implementing new marketing tactics. And then of course, negotiating for your clients, one of the most referable skills, one of the last things that I started that I delegated um, I now am out of that space as well. But this was for me when I sliced and diced it, these were the 10 things that I wanted my job to be. And I ran like this uh, with some help from a, I'll share with you the, the key hires you need to make in order to get this level of leverage. But I did this for years. What I found was, is that you can actually do this again. So you could take this group and as you continue to add more brilliant, talented people to your group, you can do this once again. And so for me, my job now consists of the 20% of the 20%. And so for me, business development and team building, that's my job total. So what this is based on is if the same principle applies in round two, then 20% of 20% would be 4% of that original list. And that 4%, I call them super tasks. Those would account for 64% of the overall result if you're just using the 80-20 math. And I would actually suggest to you that those two things account for more than 64% of the growth of the overall success that we're having as a team. And that's what I spend my time doing. Now you don't get there in overnight. This is done in stages. And I'm gonna share with you the stages and the levels of leverage that you add as your revenue permits. Now, in order to get there though, most of us would feel like we're kind of this guy where we're juggling so many things that we don't really have time to spend on business development. We don't have time to spend on team building. So business development, what am I talking about? That's, that's making it rain. That's nurturing your A-plus clients. That's implementing new programs and marketing plans. And we know that our time is best spent in business development mode. That is where we want to be as business owners. But because we're doing the marketing and because we're doing phone sales and we're going out on consults and we're having to do our own paperwork and we're running around doing showings, the business development stuff gets sort of left always kind of on the back burner. And it just is one of those things that nags at you. You wish you could get to it, but you just don't because you have so much urgency and so much reactivity in your business that you never have opportunity to go in there and do that business development that's really going to move the needle. And then of course, team building, because you're doing everything yourself and you're not taking the time to build systems and, and to build a platform for other folks to come and join, you, uh, you really don't leave yourself time to do the recruiting and the hiring of the new talent and the coaching and the development of that talent that you need because you need bandwidth for this. And that's what we're all lacking, right? If we're working 75, 80 hours a week, what bandwidth do we have to do business development and team building? It's just the last thing on the list always because your business is screaming at you with urgent, urgent things. So we need to understand this. This is the thought exercise, okay? We need to understand that people, and by people, I mean clients, do not demand your presence. They demand your standard, okay? And what I mean by that is you physically being on the showing is far less important than whomever is taking them around is operating like you would on your best day. Your standard for showing property, whether that's showing up with a road file, having the research done in advance, having asked key questions, having shown up and turned the lights on in advance of the customer coming, whatever those items are, whatever you believe is the best way to show property, that's how the person, your proxy will do it every time. And that is what your client demands, that standard, not your physical presence. And trust me, I've done this over the last 10 years. I haven't shown a property in five years and people don't get upset about it. There's nobody that calls me up and says, I thought you'd be on the showings. 
because I explained to them that they're getting the combination of my expertise and this person's availability. And they've been trained to be me on my best day, which you would get very, very seldom because of how busy I am. So you got a much better situation now having had the combination between me and my show. All right. So the thought exercise is really important. You have to get this idea that the client demands me. And if they don't get me, they're going to feel like they're being passed off. That is a myth. It's something we tell ourselves and it really has been disproven. Uh, not just by me, but by all of the team leaders now that I have that I'm coaching, as well as my top five agents of our 12 who all have junior associates now doing all of their showings. So it's, uh, it's been disproven, myth busted. So what is the way forward? How do we, how do we carve up this insane business of you know, 50 or 100 hats that we all wear, right? So I really believe that you can carve it into quadrants and that you're four key hires away from total freedom, okay? And so the first person that you hire in this process is an operations coordinator. Now, many people on this call probably have an admin. And when we hire admins, sometimes we're a little short-sighted. We're just looking for somebody capable or competent enough to come in and take some of these administrative tasks off of our plate. My contention is that this first hire should be someone who is much more than that. This operations coordinator is going to become the integrator in your business. The person who is responsible for running the whole back end, they will become the office manager eventually. And so you want to hire with that in mind. Okay, so initially the operations coordinator will wear many hats. They'll be the marketing person, they'll be doing lead coordination, they'll be doing helping with the transaction management, the client care. They'll be managing some of your vendor relationships and they're going to be handling whatever HR and the finances that you need. That's a lot of hats initially, but because when you hire this person, you're likely only doing 25 to 30 transactions, or maybe, you know, maybe you're doing 40 or 50. The workload is for each of those segments is small enough that it can comprise one job. And for those of you that want a really good uh, job description of what an operations coordinator does when they are the first hire before they get leverage. I have a, a document that I can send you. All you guys have to do is uh, throw your emails in the chat and I'll give you both the uh, 30, 60, 90 plan, which is the onboarding plan, as well as the job description for the OC. It's a very, very important role. And it's somebody that you want to take your time in selecting. This, uh, this person is going to give you the leverage right away and the bandwidth back and the rocket fuel that's gonna, that's gonna, you can build an empire with the right person. Now the next quadrant, and this person is gonna give you back a pile of time because they are licensed and they can be your proxy. They can allow you to be in two places at once. And it is very, very inexpensive leverage is the paid intern, okay? Now this paid intern, is going to be your showing partner. That's how you refer to them in the marketplace, but they're going to start to handle almost all of your showings. They're also going to be a field coordinator, which is a fancy name we give for the person who delivers feature sheets and hangs lock boxes and puts sold signs on and does all of the stuff that we, when we're making two, 300 grand a year, we still don't understand why we're the ones doing these deliveries. This person is going to handle that and win you back those couple hours a day or that hour a day that it makes no sense for you to be in the field doing that. They're also going to be the people helping you manage your pipeline. So pipeline management is one of those things that we seldom uh, really take a look at, which is knowing like an air traffic controller would know in terms of who's landing next, who's in a holding pattern, where are people at in the stages of the sales process. A paid intern, once you teach them how to look at that, will always be able to give you an at-a-glance look at, we've got four people in a holding pattern, we've got five people who meet the definition of an active buyer, meaning they're pre-qualified, we have an appointment on the calendar and they know exactly what it is that they want. That's our actives. We've got this many people right now that are pending and we've got these four people who are firm, but we have to go get client gifts for them. They're gonna manage the pipeline for you and so that they come to you on a daily basis and tell you where things are at. It's a very, very key piece. And uh, I enjoyed that for about eight years while I was still pretending to be a realtor. I had a licensed intern that was doing the bulk of the pipeline management. And now I teach that to all of my uh, team leaders on our team because 
it's a huge, huge piece of, of creating consistency in your income is to have that person managing that pipeline. The transaction management piece, this person is going to be managing lenders and title reps and lawyers and all kinds of you know, third-party people that are involved in the transaction, and they're going to help manage the timeline and give really good, clear uh, client communication as well. So this paid intern is taking a lot off of your plate, and they're going to, over time, become very good at paperwork and administrative tasks as well. That person will alone give you back 80% of your day. That is a huge, huge piece of the puzzle, and you can, I'll talk to you more about how to hire them, how to find them, how to pay them here in a minute. The fourth hire is the ISA, or the, excuse me, the third hire is the ISA. And this is where you get leverage. You bought, you're buying leads from Morgan and you feel like you reach your ceiling of complexity personally as a busy realtor at 100 leads or 150 leads a month, because how are you going to call more than that enough to move the needle? Like you need to commit to calling each of these leads, you know, five, 10 times each. And we all know the as soon as we get busy, the first thing we stop doing is calling. So if we have an ISA, you get that consistent result. They're doing all of the lead scrubbing for you. They can do circle prospecting when you take uh, a new listing. They can call all around and make people aware of it. You get other listings because of that. They can nurture leads for sometimes, I mean, I, our inside sales agents are nurturing leads for two and three years before they're ready to meet with one of our agents. Danielle, you're asking the best place to find these hires. Uh, yeah, I'm going to share with you guys that here in a second. I've got a few slides dedicated to just that. So just hang tight uh, and we'll get on that right away. The ISA's main job is appointment setting and, uh, and then obviously tracking and reporting those results to you as the team leader. That ISA is a huge piece of leverage that once you've added them in, you've now got uh, confidence in the consistency of your business and you can then scale from there because you're no longer scared to purchase more leads because more leads doesn't mean more phone calls from you. And then lastly, and it's a little bit of a luxury, but once you get to a certain production level, the sort of fourth level of, of leverage that really opens up your time, your calendar and gives you that total freedom is an executive assistant. Now, this is somebody who is going to kind of straddle your business and your personal life. They're going to research things sometimes in business and sometimes they're going to be researching the best place to take your spouse on a holiday. Right? They're going to be researching the best gift ideas for Valentine's Day, but they are somebody that is going to be pivotal in you being able to focus on that business development and focus on the things that truly move the needle inside your business. They manage your calendar. They're the gatekeeper of your calendar. In fact, you can have this person doing personal errands for you. And I like to have them running email support and, and actually emailing certain people back as me because they see how I talk. They understand my cadence. And there's some emails that do require a response, but probably not from me. And so the EA is a person that's running, uh, running interference for me um, with the, you know, I get an email roughly every 30 to 40 seconds. So I can't respond to everybody, but an EA can certainly help. And then I call it whatever, whenever, just like if you stay at the W and you call the concierge, that's their attitude. Whatever you need, whenever you need it. That's what an EA can do for you. And when you get this person plugged in, I mean, the amount that you can move the needle in your business and in your personal life, because this person's freed up your bandwidth, it's, it's a no brainer. So the benefits of, of the team approach are many, but I'm going to give you three other ones that I haven't touched on yet. So the first is standardizing service. Because you're systemizing a very high level of service, you can create a higher caliber and more consistent experience for your clients. One that's now this is the type of experience people feel compelled to tell the world about. It generates more referrals, it generates more reviews. It just builds the business. When you can standardize a high level of care, and things explode and open up. The next one is you're now creating by creating a team, you're creating a platform for scalable growth. Because you've got the entire business carved into these separate quadrants and these roles, you can continue to add talent as you go, meaning more agents to your mix and more administrative support. Interns eventually become frontline agents and your sales force will double every other year. So this platform is created by creating the team. And so it's uh, if you've got big vision for your business, these four key hires will become the platform for a scalable growth model. And then lastly, and this is the thing that I love, is uh, location freedom. 
So once you've got specialized members operating from your playbook and they're all upholding your very high standard of service, you're now free to make your contribution, that business development and team building contribution from anywhere you want. Case in point, I am leaving tomorrow to go down to Scottsdale to our place there, and I'm gonna be there till the end of March. In the meantime, I'm gonna continue recruiting. I'm going to continue with the business development stuff, the projects that I'm working on, but I'm gonna be in Scottsdale while my team's in Kelowna, and I have that location freedom because I've taken the steps to put this leverage and have way better, way smarter people in each of those other areas than me doing that job. All right, yeah, Zoom. No kidding. Zoom is a big help in the location of freedom. Good call, Morgan. The key hire number one is the operations coordinator or we call them VOC. What do they do? They do operations. They also help you with marketing and lead gen. They're going to help you with lead coordination, tracking, reporting. They're going to help you with transaction management, help you implement a client care and appreciation program, and help with project management. And in the early days, one person can do all of this. They can wear these many, many hats. Now, where it goes from there is that this operations coordinator eventually gets leverage. They become the, OC, the operations coordinator at the center of a VA hub, okay? And so a VA, the first thing you might offload would be say maybe marketing, marketing and lead gen. They would still oversee the result, but they would have a VA doing most of the tasks involved. So they would 80, 20, each one of those jobs and they would give the 80% to the VA and they would maintain the 20% that moves the needle the most or that requires somebody that has a little bit more context or requires somebody who is local to do those things. And so they're actually 80, 20 in each of those different job descriptions and putting a VA in behind them. Now, VAs can range anywhere from $800 a month up to maybe two grand a month, but they're going to be far less expensive than uh, hiring somebody and paying you know, the EI and, uh, and all of the other benefits that are attached to an employee. So this is what the, the hub eventually looks like. And so you'll have your OC at the center, and then you've got a VA that handles marketing. You've got a VA that is a lead coordinator and manages your database. You might have a VA handling the transaction management process, another VA handling some of the customer care, the concierge pieces, they're collecting reviews and referrals. You might have another VA that, have, that as you're bringing more people on, it might become a whole role for somebody to do HR and onboarding. That's where we're at now. We have a VA that helps us specifically with that. And then another one who's pulling stats on a weekly basis and helping us with all the tracking reports and everything, pulling from different G sheets and pulling from different websites and analytics and all of that and, and helping us compile a dashboard. So you eventually get to this space where that one very talented individual is running a team and they're running a team of very talented uh, virtual assistants. And that operations coordinator created the job description and the process manual for each of those little subtitles, sub jobs. And then they've got leverage and they can of course uh, experience the, the ability to impact and, and create a massive amount of uh, production for that same amount of time that they're inputting. So, once that operations coordinator is leveraged, I call it the OC leveraged edition. Their job is really the integrator of all things with your business. They're still doing, they're the office manager. They're still doing HR. Uh, they're going to handle large projects, implementations of new software or anything like that. Um, they're writing the book on procedures and controls, still going to manage all your vendors and be very much in tune with all the tracking and reporting and have those high level meetings with you as the CEO. That's what the OC does once they're leveraged. And then they kind of maintain a little bit of a thumb on each of those other roles that the VAs are handling. And they're a part of the HR is running that team of VAs. But that is a very highly leveraged OC. And uh, that's kind of where things head as you continue to grow. Looking for this OC, so going back to answer the original question there, where do you find them? First, you need to know what you're looking for. And that can be found by reading this book, Rocket Fuel by Gino Wickman. It talks about the very synergistic relationship between a visionary and an integrator. And it helps you understand who this integrator is, like at their core, what type of person would thrive in that role, who wants to be number two. They want to be the Spock to your Captain Kirk, right? They want to be the person that's behind the scenes, the person behind the person. 
but they have the ability to make things stick. You're the one that makes it go, they make it stick. And so you need to know who you're looking for first before you craft your ad, before you write your copy, because the sales copy, yeah, nerd alert, it says, the sales copy when you're writing uh, for job descriptions is probably one of the most important things in attracting talent. You've all gotten very good at writing sales copy for listings. You have to apply that same level of expertise and that same level of intentionality to the copywriting in the job description and in the ads you run on Indeed, ads you run on LinkedIn, Wise Hire, wherever the top job ads monster, uh, wherever the top places are, the marketplaces are for, uh, for hiring in your area. You gotta have the right copy and you can't write copy until you have the empathy for the person that you're writing the copy for. And that's what this book will do. So pick this book up before you hire your OC so you know exactly who it is you're trying to bring on and who it is you're trying to attract. Then you've got tools, right? We're all familiar with DISC. Um, this is not everything when it comes to hiring, but it does give you a very good uh, sense of the person. Uh, anecdotally, Erin on the call here, she provided the DISC personality profile of the person that she was hiring as, as the OC a few months back. And I saw the profile and I was able to, to look at that and say, no, this is not a person who would typically thrive in this kind of administrative role. And uh, lo and behold, I mean, the hire was made out of necessity and lo and behold, that ended up uh, being true. They weren't, they weren't a great fit. And so, so a lot of times the DISC can smoke out certain personality traits that there's just no point trying to stuff a round peg in a square hole. And so we use the DISC. And so what DISC personality profile are we looking for? So we've read, just going back a second, we've written amazing copy. We've posted our job ad on Indeed, on Wise Hire, on LinkedIn. We've boosted them. So we're spending a little bit of money to try to make sure that this is where talent goes to look for jobs. And now the applications start to roll in. Now you need a way to sift and sort. So the DISC provides you with kind of one layer of, of that sorting. We are looking for a very specific personality type. We're looking for an S primary. So that's a person that's steady, stable, supportive, sincere, right? We're looking for that S primary. And then we're looking for a C secondary, okay? And then really, if you want to get really granular, we usually like to see an I next and a D fourth. So, you know, you can jokingly and lovingly call them skids. But the important piece here, I mean, you want them to be influential and interesting a little bit because that's the likability component. The D is not important when it comes to an administrative role whatsoever. You want that high S, somebody that craves stability, who's careful and cautious and conscientious and behind that. Those two numbers need to be positive. And if you've ever taken a disc, you get a range from, you know, you could be a plus 15 D like I am, or you could be a 2 D. The higher you are, the more obviously the more of those characteristics uh, dominate your personality. So you want somebody that's maybe like an eight plus on the S and like a three or four plus on the C. That's really where you want to see that. That Those type of people, you would advance to the next stage of your hiring process. Now for us, we go a step further. DISC doesn't tell you everything. Um, Amber's question, what does the I stand for? It's influential. Here's a really good kind of funny way to kind of think about DISC. If all four people, if a D was a person and I was a person and S and C were all people standing in front of a wall, a D would, like this is me, I'm a D, would be an idiot and try to run right through the wall. The I would collaborate with everybody and convince everybody that they had the right way to get over the wall and influence everyone to get over the wall his way, but in a collaborative way. The S would wait until they had clear instruction and would execute whatever the plan was perfectly. And the C would be so cautious that they would probably stand in front of the wall, analyze it to death, and then decide it probably didn't even need to happen and just stay on the one side of the wall. It's just kind of a funny way of thinking about who these people are. But the combinations of people is what makes, uh, makes them the right fit. So that you want that S primary, C secondary. You'll find that as an agent, the people that you connect with the most over in interviews are going to be eyes. 
I people love to connect. They're very, very uh, good at making you feel like fast friends. Like I've known this person my whole life. We inherently like people who are like ourselves. And so we make the fatal mistake of hiring people who we connect with in interviews instead of looking at whether or not they truly are the yin to our yang. You don't need another you. You don't need another person who's disorganized, who likes to start projects and not finish them. You don't need another person who's a great salesperson. You've got that. What you need is somebody who finishes and follows through, which leads me to what we look for in Colby. You want, this is a perfect um, operations coordinator index result. You want somebody who's a fact finder, primary, and with a high level of follow through. Those people are going to be the ones that are going to allow all of your ideas to stick. Fact finders do research, follow through people and need to close loops. That is the most important thing. They need to be a loop closer. You are a habitual loop opener. And you need the person that's your OC to be the habitual loop closer. It needs to be so bothersome to them that they have open loops that they almost can't sleep. It's bugging them and creating anxiety. They need to finish tasks in order to feel safe and stable. So that's the person you want to hire. So if you were going to do a Kobe index, you want fact finders who follow through. The implementer is a nice thing. What you want to stay away from is the quick start. I am the classic quick start. It means I, I love to get started. I love launching new initiatives, but I need a team of people behind me implementing, following through, and fact checking. Otherwise, I'm going to get myself in a lot of trouble. That's, this is a big gas pedal. You need a few brake pedals in your, in your life as well. Okay. That was the OC. The next is the intern. Okay. This is such a key role. And I'm so surprised at how few real estate professionals are utilizing an internship to, uh, to leverage them and to build their team because interns become team members and they become highly trained, highly indoctrinated team members, the best type of team members. They've drank the Kool-Aid. They know your systems. They know how you do things. They uphold your standard and they've done a hundred deals before they hit the ground running. It's a no brainer and it's the cheapest leverage you're gonna get on the sales side. So the seven main in intern duties are client follow-up and pipeline management. So these people are gonna be, as I mentioned before, managing your pipeline, making sure that you know exactly where everybody is in the process. They're gonna handle the vast majority of showings that happen because you're gonna edify them as like showing specialist, your showing partner. And so all of your uh, showings, which is probably one of the most time consuming things that we do is gonna be done by the intern. I'll share that in a second here, Morgan, on how we comp them. Walkthroughs, inspections, all the niggly stuff where you gotta take time out of your day to run back to a house you've already sold and have to let an inspector in or do final walkthroughs. All that kind of stuff is done by your intern. You will train them on how to prepare contracts and they're going to be the ones doing that. You'll be texting them the details of the contract and they're going to build that contract for you on the fly. They're doing deal management, you know, managing the other side, managing the other realtor, managing the brokers. You're going to step back in and solve major problems. But for the most part, the whole deal management is going to be done from that intern. And then the field coordinator, I mentioned that before, that's the running around, installing lock boxes and sold signs and feature sheets and running and grabbing, you know, HOA documents, or strata documents, all the stuff that just sucks up your day that you realize can be done by somebody for much, much less. And then open houses. Sometimes your clients demand them. Also, you know that from time to time, you are going to get some business from open houses. But as we get longer in the tooth, one of the things we want to do least is an open house. But you can have your intern go. You can endear your sellers um, by popping your, your intern in there for an open house. And it's just a great way for them to do some prospecting on their own as well and cut their teeth as a salesperson. Again, another recycled slide here, but for those of you that have never seen any of my presentations before, when I say that this is an important part of our business, it's an understatement. A showing agent is one of the most important hires you can make because now suddenly as a licensee, you get to be in two places at once. It is a game changer. So how do you sell it? How do you find this person? How do you, how do you compensate them? Well, first of all, this top line, a chance to earn while you learn. There are tons of people getting into the business and they are shaking in their boots because they have no idea what the business even entails. They want to learn from somebody, but there's no, it's not set up anywhere for them to be able to do that. The thing that they crave the most is someone to mentor them, someone to take them under their wing and show them the ropes. And 
they're also very worried about the initial risk. This is why majority of realtors that get in the business end up leaving is because they actually underestimated the amount of financial runway they would need to, uh, to sustain themselves in the early stages when you're not selling any homes. And of course, there's no paycheck. So you're removing that risk so they can focus on becoming exceptional. And when I say removing the risk, I mean like a base salary of three grand a month. That is what we pay. 3K a month, it's enough to um, kind of take, remove the risk. They, they can pay their rent and they can afford groceries, bottom line. The balance of their compensation comes from the amount of deals that they get their hands on. And I suggest that you let them touch every single one of your deals and you cut them in for 5% of the GCI. So for us, you know, that's what we're talking five, $600 a transaction. And they're getting tucked in under agents that are doing minimum of five deals a month. So, you know, if they're going to, let's just say at the entry point, 60 transactions and five, five deals a month or $500 a deal, that's another 30 grand on top of their $36,000 salary. An intern making 66, 70 grand, it doesn't sound like a lot of money to us, but for them, the combination of being uh, being able to learn and getting 10 years of experience downloaded into them into a, in a year and a half or two years, that's absolutely a fair trade. Um, now, we use a minimum of 100 transaction commitment because we want to make sure that if we're going to invest time into somebody as an intern, that they're going to stick around long enough to become useful. Because the first five, 10 transactions, you're going to be holding their hand. Their training wheels are very much on and it doesn't feel like you're getting all that much value. It's only after about five to 10 transactions that they really start to uh, leverage you and become super valuable in your business. So you wanna make sure that you've got lots of runway in the relationship. So hundred transactions for, for us is usually anywhere from 18 months to two years for, uh, for an intern. So that's the commitment that they're getting. Morgan, probably don't want an intern to be a D. So we typically look for intrapreneurs, not entrepreneurs, which tend to be an I primary, D secondary. You do want some D because that's that uh, ability to, you know, keep keep going in the face of adversity, the ability to take a punch and get back up. The D is pretty required. As a, To be a successful agent, you need to have a positive D number, I feel. Not to say there aren't exceptions to the rules, but the vast majority of successful agents have a D at least in the secondary. The team leaders typically are a D primary and those folks will leave you. If you hire a high, high D, they will leave you within two years. Yeah, that, was, that was the point I was trying to make with, with Carly is that, you know, if you want these people to come learn, stay kind of thing, then you don't want them to be so motivated that it's also not a good thing in terms of your investment, right? If they're no. good for three to six months and then they're, they're so motivated, they jump ship quickly, right? Yeah, and I, yeah, I had a gentleman, uh, I could tell he was off the chart D and the questions he asked me, I could tell all he was doing was reverse engineering my operation so he could go and build it himself. And he would look <laughs> the internship or the early stages as really just as an extension of his education. You could tell he was, he was not long for the business. So we don't make that mistake anymore. We don't hire people who are trying to reinvent the wheel. We want entrepreneurs, people who want to build a wonderful business inside of our business. Now it's our job to cast a vision large enough to encapsulate the vision of these talented individuals that want to come and build their business inside yours. But again, how do you sell it? You are going to get 10 years of experience downloaded into you into two years, meaning that by the time you become a full-fledged agent, you have as much experience as agents that you're meeting out there in the marketplace that have been in the business for 10 years or longer. So you have a huge advantage. And then, again, casting that vision, eventually the student becomes the teacher. So we share with them that once they reach a production threshold of 50 or 60 annual transactions, then they qualify to get their own intern. And the whole thing comes full circle as they become the mentor and they gain that leverage that they offered that person three, four years ago when they got into the business. So it's part of the leverage track that we offer. And it's also part of them seeing them with you long-term is that they can see that if I put my head down, I focus on my production and I get up to a certain level, then I then become the, the mentor and I get to you know, live the promise of no evenings and weekends and not having to run around and do showings and not doing all of the sort of little niggly stuff that we download to the intern. So it's a pretty cool retention tool as well. So we were talking about DISC. You guys always like to jump ahead, which is great. That means you're, you're engaged and you're tracking with me. So the DISC model for the um, intern, you're looking for the a high I primary and then either an S secondary or a D secondary. 
in either case, you don't want the D to be way, way too low, um, but it's not really important that they're a highly dominant, direct, decisive doer. You're looking for someone who's more, um, more on the IS side. All right. So now we're on key hire number three, and that's that inside sales agent. Okay, and their job is to follow your web lead protocol because proper protocols on the web leads that we're buying from REW is the difference between making money and getting rich or just breaking even or, or losing money and quitting the whole thing altogether. It's all about the lead protocol. It's all about you know the double dial and the contacting them again, again and, and following up every single day with a call and email and text. And as an agent, especially a busy agent, the chances of you doing that are almost zero. In my experience in, in coaching many high productive agents, they're the worst for follow-up, the absolute worst. So an inside sales agent becomes that piece of leverage that gives you the consistency in your business and it gives you the ability to continue to scale your web leads. They can also do the outbound prospecting using a dialer. So you've got, you'll eventually have thousands of, of leads that you never contacted in a database. You can put a triple line dialer like Mojo in place and you're going to have that ISA spend an hour a day just hammering through uncontacted leads and lo and behold every couple of minutes they get one of them on the phone and you're talking to leads that no other agent on your team or especially not you was going to call that many times in order to get them on the phone so the outbound prospecting with a dialer is a great way to ramp up your roi on your leads the circle prospecting around listings is something that you can delegate to them again because you're paying them a salary you have the opportunity to uh, give them a real job description. And so you can say, every time we take a listing, you've got to do a, a tell 20 around that listing and invite them to uh, you know, pick their own neighbors, so to speak. And that generates a lot more uh, listings in the neighborhood as well, because they see how proactive that you are and one listing begets another. Their other job is to handle inbound leads. Uh, Judy asks, how much do I pay an intern? Three grand a month plus 5% of GCI on the stuff they touch. So it usually works out to about 60, 65 grand. Your ISA's job is to role play every single day. You wanna make sure that they're sharpening their saw and that they're not drifting from the skills because what we've found in listening to the recordings of our ISAs is that over time they kind of develop their own style and they start drifting from the script. And you can correlate the drift from the script to a drift from their KPIs and their numbers. They just get worse. You've got to make sure that they're role-playing daily on the scripts that made them good in the first place. Uh, so it's just a little hack there. And then you want them doing mass emails and mass texting follow-ups to older leads as well. Some, some highly leveraged activities inside the database. So they don't just spend their time calling, they're emailing, they're texting, they're doing ringless voicemail drops. There's maybe sending bomb bombs, all kinds of stuff. They're hammering the database, trying to bubble up as much opportunity as they can. And of course, the best part about it all is the reporting that you get, the dashboard, the tracking. You know, here you go, boss. I made 140 calls or I had 140 conversations this week, which resulted in 12 appointments, which resulted in nine of them signing a buyer's agency contract. And from the ones we did last month, four of those have now turned into paid or you know pending deals. That's the level of tracking that you get and can expect when you're working with an ISA versus going by your gut feeling or getting around to it eventually to fill out a, you know, a scorecard that you've made. An ISA's job is to track and report that to you weekly and you always know where your pipeline's at. Ultimately, it's a results-based business though. And so, you know, real simply, you will pay your ISA similarly the way you pay an intern, but they're gonna touch a lot more deals. 20 quality conversations a day is what you want them doing. That is about, I don't know, I've tried getting more and we've certainly allowed them to try less, but 20 quality conversations a day will result in two quality appointments per day, which is enough for them to do uh, influence roughly 10 to 12 deals a month. And as long as they maintain a 75% show up rate, those numbers will work. And so that is it. It's a results-based business. And how you sell it is this light, you know, for us, it's a licensed agent. You may live in a, in a state or an area where you can get away with unlicensed. Um, Adam asked, how do we increase the show up rate? So there's a few different ways. Um, the first step is to book appointments that are within the next two days. Don't book them out too much longer. If they wanna book something next week, just book a follow up and book it later because the chances of people showing up when you book a, you know, longer than two or three days out diminishes. The next one is using value-based reminders. So you wanna make sure that, because um, your scripting is gonna be what gets them to say yes, 
but sometimes they start to move away from the value of that, you know, whatever it is you said to get them to agree to the appointment, you need value-based reminders so that they remember the two or three bullets. You know, so for us, we talk about access to off-market properties. We talk about getting them set up on their custom portal with additional filters they don't currently have access to um, and getting them instant access to all the properties um, versus being up to 24 hours behind when they're relying on realtor.com, that kind of thing. So the value-based reminders of what they're going to get if they show up to the Zoom meeting or they show up to this in-person meeting is really key. And you know, you can do that by way of an email. You could do it by way of a ringless voicemail drop. But the best way to do a, a reminder, and you can just record this thing once and then have your ISA send it out. But it's a it's a bomb bomb video of you, the person who's going to receive the appointment and be on the appointment, saying, "Hey, I'm so excited to meet with you. I've got a lot of really great information prepared for you. Can't wait to get you access to our." Uh, off-market properties, as well as get a really firm understanding of what you're looking for and create that custom portal that gets you access to all the homes, just like I get as a realtor. Looking forward to seeing you guys. And uh, if anything comes up and you need to reschedule, of course, just shoot me a text. I know life gets in the way sometimes, but uh, can't wait to meet you. And, and uh, yeah, we'll see you soon. Something like that, right? But a bomb bomb like that sent out that value-based reminder uh, jacks the showing, uh, the increase of the showing rate from 60 to 75 easily. So how do you sell this to somebody? I mean, it does take a bit of a, an odd animal to want to get on the phone every day and, and make that their job. So the perks of the business are six-figure earning capacity. If they can't, you're not going to get a licensee or a real red meat-eating salesperson uh, to join your team if there's not a six-figure runway for them. Um, they get a ton of respect and a ton of recognition from agents because they're kind of the, they're the word also, the genesis of so much of what those agents do in their business, then of course, they're always kissing ass to the ISA. So that's a nice place to be when you're an ISA, having everybody, you know, essentially with their hand out saying, hey, you know, what can I do to get some more appointments? It's a good, it's a good place to be. You get to be part of an awesome culture, right? Your team is going to be this place where they get to uh, be part of something bigger than themselves. The, bit, the next one is not working long hours. Yeah, a really good ISA, when they get great at it, they realize they really only need to spend about three hours on the phone a day. And so if they can knock that out in the morning, knock out their two appointments, if they want to take the rest of the day off, I mean, have at it. I'm not one of those people. I'm a results-based person. If you can crank out two quality appointments a day for me that 75% of the time show up, I don't care if you work a one-hour day. I don't care if you're doing it from Costa Rica on a VoIP line. It doesn't matter to me. I'm a results-based guy. So they get that autonomy. It's also a very low-stress job. They're working less hours, so obviously that's less stressful, but they're also not uh, dealing with deadlines and they're not dealing with failed inspections and you know basement leaks and all that stuff that we deal with and the emergency calls at 11 o'clock at night they're just not dealing with that stuff so the stress of this job is way way lower than as a realtor um, they have the option or the the autonomy to decide if they want to work from the office or if they want to work from home or they want to work some sort of hybrid arrangement we like the hybrid where they come in make calls from the office see the people be part of the culture but if they want to do three days a week from home then that's great too um, and then lastly, they get to design their own schedule as long as they're hitting their KPIs. It's a results-based role. They get to be in full control. All right. I'm rambling along today, guys. Hopefully you guys aren't out of time. It is 11. Um, I'll try and speed it up. I've only got a few more slides and then I'll open up for questions. So what are the main benefits of hiring an ISA? This uh, handsome gentleman is our newest ISA, Trevor. Um, once you've gone an ISA, your return on your ad spend is going to go through the roof because very easy. Very few agents have the discipline or desire to call all the leads they pay for. You're going to do the bare minimum, not enough to really see a big ROI. Hopefully you can do it, get enough to, to see a small ROI so you don't bounce. But most people just aren't going to do the things, the amount of follow-up that's required to get that five or even 15 to one uh, return on ad spend. Agent attraction, uh, that's an abundance of leads. Once you've got that abundance of leads and you've got an ISA that's scrubbing and turning them into qualified appointments, you now have an enduring value proposition that you can use to attract talented realtors onto your team. And lastly, and my favorite is the revenue predictability. When you really understand this is a numbers game, you now know that certain inputs will create certain outputs. So if you've got consistent lead flow, let's say you're generating a thousand leads a month, you know your ISAs, once they're trained and up and running, are going to turn those into 100 appointments. And you know those 100 appointments are going to result in 30 to 35 transactions. And those are just the numbers. And I can turn the dials up or down as I see fit 
And so I've got that consistency and I've got that predictability and that's what an ISA will give you. And not until you have that ISA will you ever have that level of predictability. So, because you can mandate the amount of outbound calls, it's their job, they're getting paid a salary, you can mandate it. And once you have that, it's lights out. The disc model for this person, you are looking for some D in this case. Uh, sometimes a CD works really well. These people are usually a little bit antisocial, but they've got they've got the uh, you know the careful conscientiousness and the drive to make calls every day. That works. An ID works. A DI works. You want to stay away from like the administrative mindsets, the S and C. There's a few different um, profiles that work for an ISA, but I's. If you're a high I, it does tend to fall off the rails. These people crave more human contact than a phone job will will uh, provide. So if you hire someone who's a high eye, they might be very influential and go on the phone. They'll just hate the job in about six months. Judy asks, uh, if you meet people, they're going to see you anyway and see what you look like. So what's the big deal? Yeah. Well said. All right. And hire number four is the executive assistant. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. We talked about this already, but once you've got someone organizing your calendar, running um, interference for you, being the gatekeeper of your schedule, also setting appointments for you, doing research, handling the personal affairs, the errands, email support, screening, all that stuff, you win back a pile of time. So there's got to be levels to this, right? I mean, and your head probably wants to explode thinking about all of those hires you've got to make, all the money you've got to spend in order to do this. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the levels of leverage because this isn't built overnight. You do this one at a time. And that's why we, I went through it in sequential order with the OC, then followed by the intern, followed by the ISA, followed by the executive assistant. This follows your income growth as you go because with each new piece of leverage, the idea is that your income continues to grow. So let's say you're making 125 grand a year right now. I suggest that you always look at taking 20% of your income and investing it back into talent. So 20% of 125 grand gives you 25 grand. So you've got the ability to hire a really good VA from like my out desk, or you could hire a part-time administrator. That's about what you've got. And so you're really, your goal at this point is to try to get your income and revenue up so that you can afford the OC because that's the next level. And I, see, I, would, I would suggest to you that until you're making 250 grand a year gross, probably aren't in a position to afford an operations coordinator because they're going to start at 50K. That $50,000 person, uh, that's, that's an entry point. To get a truly talented person, they need to see the upside in the job. They need to be able to see that they're going to be making more than that in the not too distant future. But at 250, you could hire that person right away. And for a lot of people that are making 250, 50 grand sounds like a lot of money, sounds like a big pay cut for them. And it will be initially. But your goal is with all of that extra bandwidth that you've created, that you can replace that 50,000 bucks worth of income really fast. And if you don't have that confidence in yourself as a salesperson, that's probably where you should start. Next step being a 500K, now it opens up to you a little bit. At half a million bucks, you now have 100K in the kitty to spend on talent. I would suggest to you that you've got the OC and now you're ready to take that OC up to 70 grand a year and pay that intern or you know, 65K a year, let's say on the operations coordinator. And you've got the ability to pay that intern the 35, $36,000 a year salary. A half a million bucks, if you put those two people in place, you have a ton of time because you're still only doing what, 35 to 50 transactions you've got a ton of time still to work on business development and implementing things. Um, you could also hire a coach at that point. That's about when you know, coaching starts to make, make a lot of sense. Next step would be 750 grand. You've got 150,000. You've got the OC, you've got the intern. Now maybe you would add on a VA. That VA would come in and help leverage that operations coordinator so they can do more projects based stuff and help you with the business development. At a million, you can add another layer of this. So that might be where you'd add on the executive assistant. So at a million dollars, you've got two, 200K a year to spend, you add the EA. You don't really need an ISA until you get around that point in time. So that, uh, that 1.5 million is kind of where I slotted it in. You could certainly use um, like a third party ISA service like Persistence AI or something like that sooner. But an in-house ISA that's going to be making 100 grand a year probably needs to be able to influence at least 100 transactions to hit their goals, right? Because they want to make 100K a year. And so when you have, you know, you're doing enough GCI to account for them influencing 100 transactions, that's about when you would bring that person in-house. So they come in 
at about 1.5. And then uh, when you get to $2 million, you've got, you know, a whole team of VAs at this point, you've got two interns, you've got your executive assistant, your ISA, you have a transaction manager, and you probably hired a retired person to run around. And we've got our guy, Ross, he's phenomenal. And he drives around in our branded smart car and delivers lock boxes and feature sheets and orchids and all kinds of stuff to our, to our folks. So he's our field coordinator. So that is the levels to it, guys. And of course, it goes far beyond that. We have 10 administrators now in-house, but I wanted to take it only up to the 2 million mark because I didn't want to overwhelm anybody. What this allows you to do, and you guys have all seen this quadrant before, once you have this bandwidth back, you get to spend your day in the right quadrant. And that is in the important, not urgent category. The things that don't scream at you, but you know if you did them, that would, your business would surely grow. The strategizing, the planning, all that kind of stuff. The thinking, you got to give yourself space to think and to, and to really be able to, as I said, strategize. So this is where you get to spend your time afterwards once you've got this set up. You've got that quadrant two, important, but not urgent. Everything else is being taken care of by others. Once you get it right, then you're in the promised land. You can run your business from wherever, whenever, and uh, you've got a truly leveraged business that has enterprise value. It is going to bring you a ton of satisfaction knowing that you are operating in your true genius. You're operating in what you are authentically enjoying and authentically good at and everybody else. You're creating employment opportunities for others. They're in the right job for them. They're doing what they authentically do well. And your clients are getting a much better experience as a result of all these specialists. And you have a wonderful business that'll pay you whether you're showing properties or not. And that, my friends, is what I hope and wish for all of you. If you need any help implementing it, I'm here for you. Dude, that was awesome. Um, so yeah, we promised to go a little long if anyone had any QA stuff. So guys, a reminder in the chat, if you wanna, if you wanna drop your question in the chat, happy to answer it. Also, if you have any questions about, you know, obviously the REW side, um, what it takes to get all those leads in there and, and how we work together on that. Um, now, AJ, remind me, um, you have a 12 week intensive program or a uh, 12, 12 month sort of more drip program for coaching. And I think you only have three or four spots left for the intensive. Is that right? Intensive just because we're meeting weekly and there's a whole bunch of stuff that I'm backfilling each week to try to get prepared for those calls. I really only have the ability to take on four people. So if people are looking to really put some of these pillars in place and that's, you know, the marketing stuff, marketing pillars, as well as the, you know, the administrative leverage stuff. Um, I've got room to do that with four folks. It's expensive. Um, you know, that's a thousand bucks a week for 12 weeks. And then from there, if people want to just hire me on a monthly basis, it's a bi-weekly phone call and we're going to uh, connect bi-weekly for half an hour. That's a thousand bucks a month. And uh, we'll put these pieces in place over the course of the year. So what we would accomplish in 12 weeks would just take a little longer. It would take, it would take 12 months, but it's the same curriculum. I hate to tell you, man, but 12 grand isn't expensive for, for this value. I mean, that's, I mean, that's you know, when you're in the right spot, right? When you do, when you go back to that, that, um, you know, your chart in terms of like use leveraging the money you are making with these great things. I mean, what happens if you two X or four X your business? I'm pretty sure $12,000 out of that's, four that's X your business. If I'm working with the right folks, you know, you're spending tens of thousands to, to solve hundreds of thousands of dollars of problems, you know, or you might be, you know, long-term with a coach, you're spending, you know, you're spending tens of thousands to potentially make millions of dollars with, with the content and with the, you know, the foundational pieces you put in place. So I, I'm, I'm confident in the value exchange. Yeah. For some people who's getting started 12 grand is a lot of money for sure. But uh, you know, I wouldn't offer it if I didn't feel like I could provide a 10 times return on that. It's uh, no, doubt. no doubt. And well, Aaron says it's a no brainer. So Aaron is, is one of our shared customers and actually one of your referrals to us. So yeah, no, it's guys, it's, it's huge value if you're going to do the work. Right. If you're not going to do the work, then don't I would say don't take the slot from somebody else either, because, you know, it is it is a limited thing. And, and you have to be ready. You have to be in that mindset where you're willing to work the leads. You're willing to make the appointments. You're willing to do the pro like the protocols. They're, you know, they're they're so common sense once you learn them. But you got to be willing to find that person to commit to those protocols. It's it's the double call, regardless of whether you think it's a good idea or not. You have to implement it so that it can prove it's a good idea, right? This isn't bullshit. Pardon my French, but like the protocols that AJ has in place, they're proven. 
So you have to be willing. I, you know, I know nobody asked, but you know, I give you my two cents. You, you have to be willing to put in that time. If you're not ready, don't take the slot because somebody else needs it. And when it comes to calling leads, I mean, initially you got to do it yourself, A, so that you can hold someone accountable later from a place of authenticity. So you can say, hey, look, I know what it takes to book an appointment. I've had to kiss all the frogs to get to the prince. I've done this stuff. I've followed the scripts. I've been rejected. I've been hung up on all that stuff. You need to be able to confidently say that to the person you're expecting to do the work, right? If you, if you have never walked the walk, it's hard to lead. So it's good, but you want, eventually you'll come to realize just like Erin has, and now she's hired a third party ISA company to follow up on her leads is that it's not going to be your favorite part of the day. And you're going to find ways to hide from it when you get busy, especially if you've got, I mean, Erin's sometimes doing 10, 12 deals a month. You know, the last thing on her mind is getting there and calling somebody that's not answered their phone three times, a fourth time, right? That's not going to be the highest thing on her to do list that day, but to win at the game of lead gen, you need somebody who knows it's their job to not give up on a lead till they've tried 30 times. It's just yeah. that we're not going to do that as busy agents. So, but you got to do it first. You got to, you've got to learn the scripts. You've got to make the calls, get the reps in, and then you can confidently delegate this job to someone else. Nice. All right, my man. Well, I know everybody's over. Thank you so much. This has been awesome. I know there's a couple of folks who've already asked about the program, so we've captured their info. Guys, uh, Eliana, if you could share one more time, just the link to the next session. We still got 35 folks on here. Guys, click that link, sign up for the next session. It's February 24th at 10 a.m. We're going to be talking about, uh, I think we're creating a, a sales machine. Is that what, uh, what the next session is? Something like that? Uh, the ultimate sales machine. The ultimate sales machine. Awesome. So if you love this content, guys, please sign up for the next session. Uh, you know, go find, we'll, we'll, we'll send it to you via email and a follow up, but, you know, shoot AJ a five-star review. As I mentioned at the beginning of the call, I mean, this is now a full year that he's been running this thing and it's, it's proven itself. He's got tons of testimonials on our side, but every five-star review helps. So if you do appreciate this content, go ahead and jump on his Google. We'll send it to you and um, we'll hopefully see you on the next session. Thanks, right, thanks, all. thanks AJ. Appreciate you, buddy. My pleasure.